Isn't it time to admit that your government is always willing to sacrifice those human rights for the sake of business? If the United States buys crude oil for $30 billion a year in Russia, I cannot explain to my electorate why Germany should be treated differently. Germany's human rights policy is under the spotlight these days after fresh international criticism of its Nord Stream 2 gas deal with Moscow and accusations that it's soft on China. My guest this week from Bonn is the Christian Democrat MP Andreas Nick. Is it his government's policy to junk human rights in favour of business? Andreas Nick, welcome to Conflict Zone. Hello to London, Tim. A lot of people don't like your Nord Stream 2 deal in part because it puts a lot of money into the Kremlin's hands at a time when Russia shows sharply declining respect for human rights. Isn't it time to admit that your government is always willing to sacrifice those human rights for the sake of business? I don't think this is a fair description. I think Nord Stream 2 is a long-term project that has been uh, uh, critically viewed by some uh, in Germany uh, for many years. I think there's always been differences of opinion between foreign policy and economic policy, people also in my own party. Uh, but I think we have to see where we stand uh, with this project. It is briefly before completion. I think if it were to be stopped unilaterally at this stage, this would probably trigger billions of dollars in damages to be paid uh, uh, to uh, some of the project companies, including uh, Gazprom. I'm not sure that is... Uh, the adequate uh, strategy to deal with it at the moment. But uh, indeed, you, you we, say, we you should say be that, open to have... You say that, but, but you seem to cling to the view, or the government seems to cling to the view, against all the evidence, that trade can bring about positive change. Your economy minister said that, uh, Peter Altmaier said that last summer. I've always been convinced that change can be achieved through trade. But in the case of Russia, it's been changed for the worse, hasn't it? While you've been building up your trade relations over many years, Russia has crashed through sovereign international borders into seized Crimea. It's murdered its opponents on the streets of Europe, in one instance with nerve agents, launched cyber attacks on key institutions and jailed the leading opposition figure, Alexei Navalny. And your trading relationships have done absolutely nothing to discourage those actions, have they? I think you have you have described uh, quite adequately a very negative development of the situation in the Russian Federation. That is something that we have to deal with, that we have to deal with in the appropriate uh, uh, multilateral formats. Uh, uh, we have taken the case of what, Navalny to the What does that, mean? The, uh, what does that mean? To the OPC double. You know, I've, let, let, me, let me give you an example. I'm leading the German delegation to the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly. We ha this is where Russia is still at the table. We have uh, an ongoing investigation on the Navalny case in all its aspects. We will have a, a monitoring mission sent out to, uh, to Russia as soon as that is feasible. And uh, we are now really dealing with issues that are at the core of the Council of Europe's mission, like in particular compliance with verdicts uh, and, and rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. And that is, I think, where Russia will have to stand up and will be challenged. Uh, and we will have to see when, uh, if there is no uh, improvement and no uh, uh, adjustment of its behavior, uh, that we will have a very critical debate of, about Russia's future role uh, in this international format. For example, we yes, have taken but, the but, Navalny but, but case to the OPCW. Yeah, but by delinking business and human rights, you've given up virtually the only lever you have to bring out serious change. If you were serious about change, you'd take up the suggestion of the Social Democrats who proposed making the startup of Nord Stream 2 conditional on a change of behavior by the Russians, like releasing Navalny or easing tension in eastern Ukraine, something like that. But you won't do that either, will you? No, I'm, I'm, I, what I'm saying, and I'm quite in agreement with, with some of my uh, social democratic colleagues on that, that we, if we have uh, uh, an open discussion uh, with our Western allies about the future of energy relationships uh, with Russia in aggregate, uh, then we may come to, a, a con uh, to conclusions that will have... Uh, uh, also the option to have san sanctions on actual deliveries uh, of oil and gas. But that is, this is not something that should be dealt with as, a, as trying to bilateralize uh, uh, German-Russian relationship. Then we also have to talk about $30 billion of oil, crude oil purchases of the United States uh, in Russia, which puts more money into Russia's pockets as, uh, uh, as uh, Nord Stream could ever do. Then we so should have a very you're open not going and to make a stand debate. because the U.S. isn't making a stand. You, you, you don't act on principle oh. here. 
What I, uh, my question no, to you is what, saying, what, what, what conclusion do you think Russia and other trading partners of yours have drawn from this statement but that you de-link business from human rights? They've drawn the conclusion that Berlin will huff and puff a bit on the margins for public consumption, but under this government, it's never going to let human rights stand in the way of a business deal, is it? It's made that clear. I don't agree, I don't, I don't agree with that, and I, I object to the, uh, to the attempt by some to singularize uh, Germany in this issue. I think if uh, the whole of Central Eastern Europe buys energy from Russia, if the United States buys crude oil for $30 billion a year in Russia, I... I cannot explain to my electorate why Germany should be treated differently from anybody else. If we come to a joint position in the in the Western alliance that that the relations with Russia are deteriorating to the extent that we should put uh, energy relations uh, uh, on hold, or uh, then I think we we have a, a basis to talk, but not by trying to unilateralize the, uh, uh, Germany in its relationship with Russia for other purposes, like trying to sell. Uh, uh, shale gas uh, oil from uh, shale gas, uh, shale, uh, gas from uh, Texas or anything. We should have a very honest debate, and then it should be uh, applying to everyone, uh, and not everyone in the EU, everyone in the Western Alliance, but not as trying to singularize Germany in this uh, in this context. Well, let's let's talk about that debate, Mr. Nick. You're always concerned to be seen as good Europeans acting in support of common interests. You're the driving force in that. So in January, when the European Parliament overwhelmingly passed a resolution calling on the EU to halt the completion of Nord Stream 2 with 508 votes, as it happens, you simply ignored it. Pretty casual attitude, wasn't it? The fact that the project causes significant friction with your European partners, especially France, the Baltic States, Poland, doesn't seem to be of any importance to you either, does it? Again, let me let me reiterate, we are not at the beginning of a project. If we, I, I'm, And I can prove to you that when, when the project was set up beginning, there was a lot of criticism, including myself, from the foreign policy uh, responsible uh, in, in my own party and, 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 and across the board. We now have to look at a situation where the project, which has all legal permits in place, is short of completion. And I would st strongly recommend that we shift the focus of the debate on the actual deliveries rather than of a specific piece of infrastructure. And if there is a, 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 a justified objection against uh, energy uh, supplies from Russia, it should uh, apply unilaterally and it should not only apply to one specific mode of transport. And I think on that basis, I think we should move towards uh, a common position. I'm very much in agreement with uh, Secretary Blinken, who more than 30 years ago, uh, uh, in, a, in a very Shrewd analysis concluded that applying sanctions to an, an enclosed ally is a very bad idea and is bad for alliance and, and cooperation. Well, he might have that, changed. I he might I have changed his views by now, Mr. Nick. Certainly, the the White House uh, and and President Biden have labelled Nord Stream 2 a bad deal for uh, for um, Europe and a bad deal for the world. Um, I want to ask you this. 18 companies have now pulled out, even at this late stage of the Nord Stream 2 project, they've pulled out. 18 companies announced at the end of last month, worried about sanctions, that they might target them directly, and by the fact that both Democrats and Republicans have voted to expand sanctions later this year. Crucially, most of the companies that have gone are insurers. So if you can't get the work now underwritten, the project's in serious trouble, isn't it? Again, I think I know there is a, a lot of resistance in Congress, probably one of the few uh, uh, subjects on which Democrats and Republicans may be able to agree in Congress. I understand that the U.S. administration and the Secretary of State is having a difficult dialogue uh, with his own Congress in that regard. But I can only uh, recommend that we try to get to common ground rather than coercing an ally. Uh, by unilateral measures. I think this is poisonous for the relationship. Uh, and I know that uh, smart people in the government, including Secretary Blinken, are fully aware of that poisonous effect and are aware that this is not the right strategy. We are, I think, prepared to work towards common ground with our allies in Europe and in the United States. But uh, we should do this in a way that is not trying to single out one particular country for other selfish reasons. Well, you can't at this stage tell me when the project is going to be completed, can you? Isn't, isn't it time that Germany listened to some of the criticism at home and abroad instead of just plowing on regardless? I see that you've also lost Bilfinger, the German civil engineering concern. What if other companies jump ship now? 
Are you seriously telling me there are no discussions within your coalition about putting completion on hold, no cold feet in those upper echelons of power in Berlin? I think, again, uh, we are uh, uh, following the rule of law, and this is a project that has all legal permits in place. Trying to terminate that by unilateral action by the German government at this stage would probably trigger billions of dollars in, in damages and remedies. Uh, I think there are smarter ways also going forward that will create more leverage also in the relationship with Russia. Uh, as you uh, mentioned, I think there are ideas to uh, have some kind of a backstop mechanism. Uh, and if we target actual supplies rather than the completion of a particular piece of infrastructure, this is something that could lead us towards common ground also with our partners and allies in Europe and in the United States. You talked earlier about reservations within your own party about this. Norbert Röttgen the foreign policy adviser, has called the project an instrument of political war. He presumably meant an instrument of political war for the Kremlin. The Kremlin has used it as a lever, a political lever in the past, its gas supplies to Europe. What makes you so sure they're not going to use that lever again? I think we have a, a history of more than 50 years of reliable uh, uh, energy supplies from Russia, in, even during the, the, the high time of the Cold War. But it wasn't uh, 2014, that, uh, 2015. Indeed. They interrupted the, the gas supplies to Europe. Uh, I was talking about Germany. Uh, I think there were specific issues with regard to certain countries in Central and Eastern Europe. We have done a lot to reverse gas flows in the European system. The bulk of the gas supplies to U Ukraine now comes from west to east rather than from east to west. I think integrating uh, our partners in Central and Eastern Europe into a pan-European gas infrastructure is a very important element of making them more robust, more resilient against potential interference from Russia. We should work together to reduce their dependence on uh, energy supplies from Russia. And uh, uh, even in that regard, uh, Nord Stream 2 can, uh, can, have, uh, uh, can be helpful. Uh, we, uh, we are aware that there are uh, concerns that uh, cl clearly uh, countries in Central Eastern would rather reap transit fees uh, uh, on these supplies. But if we can uh, ensure that they will be supplied from Western Europe, it should also uh, benefit their own energy security going forward. Mr. Nick, also controversial in your party as well as internationally is your policy towards China, regarded by many as toothless. Here, the idea of change through trade, Wandel durch Handel, as you call it in German, has been a spectacular failure on the human rights front, hasn't it? I think it is not only a German experience. I think it is a, a universal experience that we have to take leave from two uh, assumptions, I think, or explicitly or implicitly, that uh, China policy has been based on. One assumption that uh, if GDP uh, raises above a certain level, that uh, in a country that... Uh, liberalization and democracy will come almost automatically. But we're also facing uh, uh, the, uh, the insight that unless what we have traditionally believed, that a state-led economy can apparently be pretty successful and pretty competitive uh, even over the longer term. And I think that is something that we have to draw conclusions from. Uh, I yes, agree but we're, that we're we, ignoring uh, we again probably... the issue of human rights. I mean, Germany, along with the rest of the EU, was content to sign a major investment deal with China even though it refused to make any concrete promises about complying with human rights standards, including the ban on forced labor. And you ended up being satisfied with a totally meaningless pledge that China would make what it called continued and sustained efforts to ratify the relevant convention. It shows what really matters to Europe these days and to your government, doesn't it? Money, money over morality, money over human rights. I would I would uh, totally disagree. Uh, uh, I think, uh, but let me let me challenge the contrary position. I think if uh, uh, I am convinced that decoupling is a very uh, 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 misled a concept. Uh, economic decoupling will not work for anyone in the world, not even for the United States. Uh, I think the idea is simply to cut the world into two or three different pieces that do not interact with each other in any way uh, is a false uh, is, is a false uh, strategy. And I think where what we see also with a recent speak, uh, speech by Secretary Blinken that European and American uh, perspectives on how to deal with China converge. I think from a European definition of China being a partner, a competitor, a systemic rival at the same time. I hear from Secretary Blinken 
a relationship with China will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. I think this is a lot of common ground, and I think we, we need to adjust well, we're, that. We're, get, and, we're getting uh, away from sure the subject of, of human rights, and I understand you want to steer it away, but the fact is you're becoming known for some pretty questionable ethics in China. Last year, the boss of Volkswagen, Herbert Diess, was asked about the wisdom of opening a factory in Xinjiang, where up to a million Uyghur Muslims are incarcerated for indefinite periods, effectively in labor camps, and he said he didn't know anything about it. Is ignorance the best uh, defense that uh, your industry has these days? Uh, absolutely not. I think, uh, uh, and you will not hold me accountable for any uh, potentially misled uh, uh, opinion by any senior German uh, businessman. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, taking this to extremes and say let's simply decouple the relationship is not working for anybody in the world. May I remind you that it was uh, the the, foreign, uh, the prime minister of Singapore who a year ago in foreign affairs made the point: don't make us choose between a relationship with uh, China or with the United States. Uh, we need to be able, I think, to uh, that's to not balance, the choice, uh, though, is it? The uh, choice is between respecting human rights or not caring about it. It turns out the German firms are supplying the technical backbone for the huge textile industry, also in Xinjiang, where hundreds of thousands are forced to work in the cotton fields. Do you like the optics of that particular scenario? I think we have we have just enacted uh, a law in the German parliament uh, which requires uh, uh, more significant compliance of uh, German companies also in their supply chains throughout the world in uh, securing uh, human rights and uh, uh, labor standards uh, and environmental standards, not necessarily to the delight of everyone in business. I think we have come to a uh, conclusion in a law that will be a much more effective and that I'm pretty convinced that we will achieve many objectives in this regard, not by government to government relations, but ensuring that global companies in their supply chains are taken, uh, are holding, are held responsible also by their customers for securing that minimum standards for labor and environmental safety are, uh, are safeguarded across the world in their global supply chains. Ms. Ms. Mr. Nick, your firms have supplied machinery that was almost certainly being operated by slave labor in Xinjiang. I asked you whether you like the optics of that particular scenario. According to customs data obtained by the South China Morning Post, sales of German parts for textile machinery in Xinjiang have gone up 30 times over the past three years. 30 times while the reports of appalling human rights abuses multiplied in that region week after week. Do you or do you not find that unacceptable? I find that hard to accept. Uh, I have not been able to do my own research on whether the specific link that is uh, uh, created or suggested there is is valid, but it, it is a major issue of concern as you as you raise it. And as, as I mentioned, I think we, ha we are enacting uh, legal requirements and obligations on companies to safeguard uh, respect for human rights and minimum labor standards across the world in their global supply chains. That is something that we are just enacting. That is, I think, not a question bilaterally applying to China, but on a much more global scale. Uh, and uh, uh, that is what, what we need to do. It is, it is a piecemeal process. It is difficult. It is challenging. Uh, but uh, what I'm telling you is that just trying to occupy the, poten the potential or presumptuous moral high ground by saying we do not do business with anyone in the world anymore is not a strategy. And it is sometimes suggested with particular uh, vigor, uh, rigor with, uh, towards Germany by those who would then prefer to fill the spots uh, for that business themselves. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm a bit opposed against uh, hypocrisy in this regard. That is, These are standards that should apply universally to everyone and where not one particular country should be singled out for other reasons. Well, uh, one country which is supplying more than anybody else to the textile industry in Xinjiang, where slave labor is being employed, deserves to be singled out, doesn't it? And that's your country. And what you don't particularly find this a, a proud moment to be confronted uh, with this news that uh, you are supplying these uh, companies in Xinjiang. Um, but your party seems to have its head in the sand where this is concerned, doesn't it? Where this whole issue is concerned. Where, where's, where, where's, the, where's the red line here? You appear to have crossed it, don't you, by supplying this machinery to these firms in Xinjiang. Yes or no? It's very simple. 
I think we are, we are in Germany. We are not a state-run uh, economy. We are a, a, a market economy. We uh, we uh, apply a certain minimum standards. Uh, I have just mentioned that we are enacting a new law uh, with regards to uh, global supply chains of German manufacturers. Uh, uh, so that, that is something that we are doing. Uh, I think not every single export decision by a German company, I think, can immediately be attributed uh, to uh, uh, to the German government. Uh, well, you could in, do something about it. Outside. You could do something about it if you wanted thought, to. And you could condemn it. And your party could condemn said, it. And your chancellor could condemn it. But you don't. But you don't. And that's telling in itself, isn't it? As, as I said, we have just enacted a new law on, uh, on uh, compliance uh, to human rights standards in uh, uh, global supply chains. We have worked in particular with the textile industry uh, to uh, uh, have a, a seal of approval for compliance with certain labor standards, avoidance of child, child labor and everything in places like Bangladesh uh, or, or otherwise. So that these are issues that are in a, in a global economy that are, is more and more intertwined will continuously we have these difficult challenges but what i'm trying to work towards is that we use the leverage of international firms to uh, uh, impose labor standards uh, across the globe which i think i'm pretty sure will be much more successful as a long-term strategy as trying to impose that by government to government relations okay uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the time we have whatever left. kind of boycotts in the time we have left, Mr. Nick, I just want to look at what many people are calling the COVID vaccine fiasco in Germany. It's not what you needed in the run up to parliamentary elections later this year and crucial regional contests this weekend, is it? Polls already show huge dissatisfaction. Two thirds of Germans say they're unhappy with key aspects of your COVID policy, particularly the slow vaccination program. Uh, fact is, you've become accident prone, hasn't it? haven't you? The government's running out of steam. Well, what, I think what I see is that for for understandable reasons, I think patience is running out with uh, uh, people who have been uh, uh, exposed to uh, to lockdown uh, uh, policies for quite some time. There is a lot of impatience. Understandably, there was a lot of hope regarding to vaccination. I think some of the expectations have probably been unrealistic. I have always taken the view if by mid-year 2021 we would have... Uh, universal vaccination, this would be a, a very good result, and I'm pretty convinced we will get there. Uh, I think there were different strategies better, applied for the you, you have the main professional body for GPs, the German Association of GPs, saying it was bad enough that the EU ordered too few vaccines too late, but now we have all these jabs being stockpiled, unused. Now, that is unforgivable, isn't it? That's coming from the main GP's no, we will professional body. We will be opening the vaccination program uh, end of this month uh, towards uh, the, G the GPs. And I think they will have to make a, a major contribution to this. I think if 50,000 GPs every day vaccinate uh, t 20 people each, we will have 5 million vaccinations per week. We will, we will be able to complete this by, by the end of the summer. But it's also fair to think that for the GPs, uh, a minimum supply of, uh, uh, of vaccines Per, per GP was necessary to involve them. If we give 10, 10 vaccines per week to, to GP, we put him into a very difficult decision. We're now rolling this out more universally, and I'm pretty sure we get there. We took different decisions, and some of that will have to be critically reviewed from hindsight to focus on the on the over 80 years old of those being in in uh, in, in care homes. Uh, we took a but you don't have long to turn around or... public perceptions. You have these key um, elections coming up and your party's reputation has been further damaged by the scandal of two of your fellow MPs forced to resign because they netted huge commissions on deals to procure masks. Other scandals are also piling up along with the accusations that your party is shoddy and corrupt. Is it? I think we have we have seen individual cases that are uh, totally ashaming and totally unacceptable. Uh, I think we need to go through a very clear process of making sure that compliance with uh, ethical standards is uh, is ensured. Uh, uh, I think this is these are nevertheless individual cases. Uh, we should uh, not try to use them uh, in a demagogue fashion uh, to discredit uh, parliamentarians uh, and politicians who serve the public uh, to, to its best interest. But we are, of course, in a responsibility ourselves to, to clean up uh, where there are uh, unforgivable uh, uh, 
violations of, well, there, of ethical standards. Well, there are a lot of cases. Of there are a lot of cases piling up, aren't there? Another CDU member of Parliament, Axel Fisher, is being investigated for suspected corruption. Prosecutors claim he and other former and current members of the Bundestag received voting bribes from Azerbaijan. He says the allegations are groundless. Another, Philip Damto, is under scrutiny for his lobbying work for a U.S. company. Is this the tip of the iceberg in your party? What happened? People got too greedy. What is it? Let me, let me, let me be very crystal clear on the Azerbaijan and the Council of Europe issue. I took over the position of Axel Fischer at 2018 to take care of the anti-corruption investigation in the Council of Europe, which we undertook, where an, a number of members were banned for life uh, from the Assembly. Uh, both Mr. Fischer and Mrs. Strenz were no, no longer sent to, uh, to the Council of Europe by my party in 2018. Both of them have not been renominated as candidates uh, for the next parliamentary election. Sometimes in a democracy, cleaning up takes, takes a bit of time. All right, OK, Andreas process, Nick, we've, but we've, it's, but we're it's running happening. out of time. We're running out of time. Thank you very much for being with us on Conflict Zone. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Good to see you again. Thank you.